This is a talk about the system of sensing. Um, I originally wrote about the system of sensing in a book called Autism and Sensing the Unlost Instinct, which was published in 1995. It, uh, the reason why it was packaged as an autism-related book uh, was because we all begin in that, that system of sensing, a world before mind, um, where we have a pre-conscious state that is a state of beingness rather than up there in mind and conscious awareness. And we're yet to accumulate that world of meaning, that dictionary, um, uh, which then changes uh, how we experience the world. We start to experience it with interpretation, with interpreting rather than sensing it. And uh, then after that, we gain all the indoctrination and inheritance of culture and ego, etc., and all the cladding. And then that changes how mind experiences it. And so it's a progressive level of change in how we experience the world. Um, but as a person who grew up um, meaning deaf and meaning blind until uh, late childhood when I gained language with meaning and until my 20s when I got cohesive visual perception, um, I retained a lot of that early capacity to navigate my world by pattern and theme and feel. And um, so I want to talk a little bit about what that system is, um, how we've all come from it, how some people lose it, and why it's a good thing to get back. So the system of sensing is, is our first world. And in, a, in our first world, we're really in our own world. Um, uh, we, it's this, this place where we accumulate huge amounts of of experiences, sensory experiences, emotional waves, tones, movement, uh, textures, smells, sounds, uh, uh, colors, patterns. Um, we're uh, we're we're both sensing this stuff. We are intuiting this stuff. We are experiencing it um, by merging with it. We become part of the music. We feel the music inside of us. We become part of that texture until we can't feel the separateness of ourselves and that texture. We're wrapped up in that texture. We um, experience the colours, but we move through the colours and the colours feel like they're moving through us. Um, we meet, um, uh, we encounter people but we experience them like a kind of living music, like this music of beingness that has a different shape in a sense, um, each one, and, this, and their shape changes how we experience it. So it's not yet a world of, the, of self and other. It's a world of self in other and other in self. And it's not a world of, um, uh, of, of imitating. Uh, it's a world of merging in order to know something as the basic sensory and emotional experience of what we're merging with. So we are these experience machines in a sense and um, it's not yet a place where we consciously think about things. It, we're getting such a, um, a, a soup of sensory and emotional information. Um, uh, there isn't those structures yet with which to interpret and gain conscious awareness. So we're in a a very pre-conscious state and we're taking in far more than we can actually consciously process and this is building up those those maps the the repertoire the dictionaries uh, in those connections in the brain that have not yet been made and as such because we haven't got all those connections made there's nothing to filter what's coming in 
And so we get overwhelmed and we, you know, we contract and we scream and we look away and we, you know, cry or we space out or we dissociate or however we manage that, which I guess you could say is a bit autistic, a bit autistic, and therefore we all have this autistic response to the world. And some people continue to have that and others make enough connections in their brain that they begin to filter what's coming in and they thereby cut down on a large amount of what's coming in and they build their repertoires so that everything that's coming in progressively is coming in with meaning and it's manageable and then we call those people less autistic. (laughs) Um, But because we're getting flooded with information and we haven't yet got those structures to filter this stuff, what happens with all that accumulated information is is it, that it sort of sits within us. Um, and if and if somebody was to um, uh, like as we get older and they they try to tap into that directly, we might not feel we have that knowledge, that conscious awareness, and therefore we can't respond. But if they uh, do something that, uh, you know, maybe isn't uh, what we expect or they address somebody else, we might find that this unknown knowing suddenly comes through and it surprises us. It surprises us because we didn't consciously know that we had any of that understanding, that we'd done anything with that knowing, but it's unknown knowing because it came in without the filtering and it was being processed back there in that pre-conscious state, not in the conscious state, not in mind, what we know of as conscious mind. The pre-conscious state is is really more, I guess, body. (laughs) It's more like body brain uh, rather than mind and so then if we can progressively talk about how we move out this this state of emergence this state of beingness this state of sensing this place of unknown knowing this my world how what's what is our next uh stage if you like and our next stage is really that we move into being a sensory being in interaction with the external world. I also wanted to mention that I was a bit disturbed while I was reading the research on these neurological brain-based aspects of autism. I found that the language used in a lot, not all, but a lot of the content was quite in line with the deficit model of autism. And a lot of it seemed focused on like, oh, if we understand these neurological differences and autistic brains, then one day we might be able to fix them. I just want to say that's so against what I stand for. It's so against what almost everyone active in the neurodiversity space stands for. I don't support the search for treatments or cures for autism. I don't support researchers or research that claim in any way to have autism eradication as their goal. It's unfortunate that they don't seem to realize just how many people they're alienating with their word choice and the perspectives they're taking or allowing themselves to uncritically fall into. I guess the equivalent might be a study where they're researching differences in the brains of gay or queer people versus the brains of straight or non-queer people. And in addition to objectively studying these differences, they oddly also take a stance that being queer is not ideal or even that there could one day be a cure or brain-based fix for being gay. Now that sounds obviously horrible and absurd, right? Well, it's also horrible and absurd for it to be 2024 and researchers and other experts still talking this way about autism and being autistic. Like assuming we all want to be cured or assuming that we want interventions that get rid of our, sorry, getting worked up here and trying to destroy my equipment. I will say that I think that autistic people who want a cure or intervention that theoretically could take their traits away or greatly reduce them have likely internalized a very negative deficit-based view of autism. 
I mean, it makes sense if you grow up being told in both direct and indirect ways constantly that autistic traits are inferior or undesirable, and you've never challenged these perspectives for yourself or been able to, heck yes, you're going to hold these same perspectives. What we're seeing, and this is society in general, it's the way it's structured. Uh, everything is inverted. Everything is upside down. And there's no greater example of that than uh, misinformation and disinformation being terms of abuse for people producing credible evidence delivered by people who are lying through their teeth 24 hours a day, even in their sleep, probably. Um, so um, we, we have to um, not worry about uh, labels and get right. uh, upset about labels. We just need to keep pounding out what we're saying because... You know, in the end, um, the thing that gets people to look at uh, other possibilities more than anything else is their own experience. <laughs> Sure.